when God told Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was it symbolic for something else, or was it about the literal fruit of a literal tree? When someone claims that this command in Genesis is not to be read literally, then they automatically make themselves the master of the meaning of the text, and then they feel free to make up an interpretation that suits their own personal agenda. And the process of turning passages of the Bible that can be read literally into non-literal allegorical texts is called allegorizing scripture. A person guilty of this interpretational sin might say the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not a literal tree, but instead it was a metaphor for some philosophical concept. Or they might say the serpent was not literally the devil, but instead he was a personification of human weakness. But regardless of the things that they say, when anyone interprets a plain, literal passage in an allegorical, non-literal way, that person gets to decide what God said instead of letting God speak for himself. And by doing this, they contradict God, his son, Jesus Christ, his holy prophets, and his holy apostles. Because the word of God plainly records that a literal Eve was tempted by a literal serpent called the devil and Satan, and a literal Adam sinned when he also ate of the fruit of a literal forbidden tree. And the truth is when someone allegorizes passages of the Bible that God meant for us to understand literally, they're really attacking the authority of the Word of God. Therefore, since the 1800s, many people have actually been attacking the authority of the Word of God when they deny the literal meaning of the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And they say things like, even though scripture says evening and morning, and day 1, day 2, day 3, and so on, these are not really literal 24-hour days. Meanwhile, they ignore the fact that when God declared the fourth commandment, he based it on the days of creation, and specifically said, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So did God mean that we should work for six billion years and rest for one billion years? If so, why did Jesus our Lord have a weekly custom of going to the synagogue each Sabbath? Or for that matter, why did Paul have the same weekly custom? Also, why did the manna fall for six literal days of the week, but not on the seventh literal day? You see, when someone allegorizes a passage that can be literally interpreted without any contradiction to the rest of Scripture, they're really deceiving themselves and all who will listen to them. And their deception can be easily spotted because it will contradict many other passages in the Bible. Obviously, when God told Adam not to eat of that tree, he literally meant it. When God told Noah to build an ark, he literally meant it. And when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, he literally meant it. Abraham did not get in trouble with the Almighty in any way for putting his son on the altar or even for preparing to plunge the knife into his beloved child. And God did not get angry with Abraham when he did those things because Abraham was following orders and proving that he feared the Lord. Truly, God was giving these individuals 
very clear instructions to do these very specific things. But in a very similar passage that we'll look at later, some people who allegorize scripture would claim, when God issued a very clear command, he was really wanting the recipient to do something totally different. And when someone begins to say things like that, they're actually adding to and taking away from what scripture really says. Plus, when they do this, they're not only modifying the word of God, they're also placing themselves in the position of Pope or Guru over other people. And we can say this because people can't naturally arrive at the conclusion they're teaching because the interpretations that they're peddling don't match what the text literally says. If you were on a deserted island and you had never heard anyone on earth teach you about the Bible, but a Bible fell from the sky, would you ever naturally think that the seven days of Genesis weren't literal 24-hour days with evenings and mornings? So, when you hear someone telling you that the plain sense reading of scripture is not what God really meant, you can ask that person, did God literally tell Hosea to marry a prostitute? Or better yet, did God literally tell Ezekiel to cook his food over human dung and then allow Ezekiel to cook it over animal dung? Absolutely. And we know this because God does not tell people to do things that he doesn't expect them to do. Yes, when the Bible records, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. We don't think that God really meant that Hosea should buy a new horse, right? And in another place, God told Ezekiel, You shall eat it as barley cakes and bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. Then the Lord said, So shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, for I will drive them. Some people wrongly believe that God was tempting Ezekiel to sin when he commanded him to cook with human dung. But this is very dangerous thinking, friends. And it's dangerous because it would lead to people deciding for themselves which commandments of God they should obey and which commandments of God they should reject. Instead, we must forever assume that the all-knowing God of the universe knows how to communicate, and when he speaks, we must obey. As Paul wrote in Scripture, Every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused, if it's received with thanksgiving, because it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And when God told Ezekiel to use human dung as fuel to cook his food, the phrase, it is sanctified by the word of God, would have most certainly applied. But God also knows our weaknesses. So scripture goes on to record Ezekiel saying, Ah, Lord God! Indeed, I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has abominable flesh ever come into my mouth. Then he said to me, See, I am giving you cow dung instead of human waste, and you shall prepare your bread over it. Truly. God really meant for his prophet to cook his food over human dung, and Ezekiel would have been completely justified before God if he would have followed those clear instructions. But because Ezekiel considered the idea unclean, God gave him a less offensive alternative after Ezekiel protested. But we really must understand, 
Ezekiel would have been doing a righteous thing if he would have obeyed the original command, because that command came from the mouth of the Lord. Truly, if God tells us to do something and we do it, we will most certainly not be in trouble with God. And we see that these passages and many, many more show that God always says what he literally means, especially when he gives us a command. But what are some examples of passages in the Bible that are not exclusively literal? Well, Daniel records, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. But next he also wrote, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me, and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So there are some key things to notice in this passage, things that can be applied to all truly symbolic passages. First, there was no literal interpretation of the vision that could apply before the solution was given to Daniel in verse 17. Second, the vision was not something that's normally observed, because lions don't ordinarily have eagle's wings, bears aren't normally lopsided, leopards typically don't have four heads or the wings of a bird, and beasts usually don't have iron teeth or ten horns. And third, we must notice that the vision did not command Daniel to do anything. So instead of being prescriptive, symbolic visions are descriptive, and they describe something in a symbolic way. Therefore, symbolic visions in the Bible are visions that cannot be understood literally without an interpretational key that identifies what the items in the vision represent. And... Since they can't be understood literally without interpretation, it's not considered allegorizing when we interpret visions that contain clear symbols that require the additional step of interpretation. However, we should also note that symbolic visions often distort nature in order to highlight some particular feature of the objects being symbolized, and even when a symbolic vision doesn't distort nature, it typically describes some very specific details about the symbols in the vision, and those details help us interpret the symbols. And finally, 
symbolic visions never command the recipient to do anything. Instead, they describe something typically about the future. So the presence of an imperative command that directly relates to the objects in the vision indicates that the objects in the vision are not to be considered symbolic. And with these principles firmly understood, we see, once the basic connection to reality was explained, Daniel could apply the concept of kings and kingdoms to the vision. And with that interpretational key, then every item in the vision fit together perfectly and every detail was included for a reason. For example, the lion with eagle's wings represented a king and a kingdom, and most scholars agree that the first kingdom in Daniel's vision was Babylon. And amazingly, the Ishtar gate constructed by Nebuchadnezzar II was adorned with lions that appear to have wings, and the lion was a symbol of Babylon within their own culture. So God never includes any meaningless details in the symbolic visions he gives to his prophets, and every single detail should match up with reality in some way or another. Now, we've just reviewed what is known as a symbolic vision from the Bible, and we saw that symbolic visions, and even dreams, have some basic common characteristics, and we have proven we can only claim that a passage is symbolic when there is no obvious literal interpretation available that adequately explains every detail of the vision. And this fact may cause some to argue that a particular passage they want to interpret non-literally is a parable or a metaphor instead of a symbolic vision. Truly, the Bible uses many parables or universally understandable stories that convey a truth in a way we can easily relate to, and Jesus famously used many such parables. In fact, in one of those metaphorical lessons that we refer to as the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus described wheat and tares growing together, and the owner of the field waiting until the time of the harvest to separate the two. Then Jesus added that the wheat was gathered by the workers into the barn, but the tares were burned in the fire. And after reading about Jesus relaying this common, everyday scenario that we can easily relate to, in contrast to the dreamlike strangeness of a symbolic vision, we read, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, just as we saw in the symbolic passage, each item in the parable had a role in the explanation, and none of the words that Jesus used were given in vain. Therefore, the main difference between a parable and a symbolic vision or a dream is a parable uses everyday, relatable stories to help us see a spiritual truth, while a symbolic vision uses very uncommon imagery, like lions with wings or four-headed leopards. 
And that's why symbolic visions typically cause great confusion to the recipient until the interpretation is revealed. Also, while symbolic passages don't include overt imperative commands, in the passages we call parables or metaphors, there sometimes are commands included, but they're much easier to understand and apply. And by the way, we can recognize metaphorical passages by the usage of the words like or as. For example, Jesus said, You yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. By using the word like, Jesus made a metaphorical comparison between a servant waiting for his master and his disciples waiting for his return. Also, the larger context of the passage mentions, Jesus' return will happen at a day and an hour we don't expect. So the command to be ready and watching simply means that we should be obeying what Jesus taught and doing his will as faithful servants when he returns. And in this way, we will not be ashamed at his coming. You see, the parables and the metaphors of the Bible are not very hard to understand. But symbolic passages are a little more mysterious, and they cannot be understood until we discover what each symbolic item represents. However, in all of these types of passages, we're never free to arrive at our own interpretation without clear scripture to back up our interpretation and explain every little detail. That's why Peter wrote, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And with all of this in mind, when God told Jeremiah to wear a yoke, and when God told Joshua to conquer the promised land, and when God told Paul to remain in Corinth, they obeyed what God commanded. So why would a vision given to Peter about food be any different? Peter himself tells us that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, so we must not dare to go beyond what is written and what God literally said. In fact, when we do, we place ourselves above Scripture, and frankly, we call God a liar. Ask yourself, if Peter would have obeyed the command to rise, to kill, and to eat, could God have judged Peter for obeying his voice? Absolutely not. If so, God would have contradicted himself while supposedly tempting Peter to sin. But James states very plainly, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God himself tempt anyone. Also, let's be clear. Peter actually did interpret the vision he was given very literally when he replied, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Thus, even though Peter was slow to accept all that the vision commanded, Peter understood from the very beginning the vision was about eating and food. But some wrongly claim that God didn't really mean what he commanded Peter three times to do. And frankly, they allegorize the Lord's words and claim it was only a symbolic vision about the Gentiles and not about food at all. And friends, they even claim that Peter was the one who said the vision wasn't about food. Meanwhile, the fact is, Peter never said that. Not once in the Bible, not even in Acts 10.28, did Peter claim the vision had nothing to do with food. 
No, that's something certain people are imposing on the text. You see, Peter never mentioned the vision in any way when he said the following. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came, without objection, as soon as I was sent for. I ask then, for what reason have you sent for me? Does anyone see an explicit, clear reference to the vision in that passage? If this passage contained the supposed interpretation of the vision, would Peter not have mentioned the vision here, or repeated this supposed interpretation later in Scripture? After all, Peter the Apostle was there when Jesus said, The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So I humbly ask, where is the passage of the Bible where the Apostle Peter says, The sheet is the world, the animals are the Gentiles, and rise, kill, and eat means go, preach, and baptize? How do we know that Peter wasn't referring to the Holy Spirit, telling him to go with the men Cornelius sent? How do we know that Peter wasn't referring to Jesus teaching him that nothing that enters the mouth of a man can defile him? We certainly cannot eliminate those possibilities by anything Peter said in Acts 10.28. Brothers and sisters, it's not adequate to claim that Peter's first statement to Cornelius fully explains away the vision. No, the lack of a reference to the vision in Acts 10.28, the context of chapters 10, 11, 15, and 21 of the book of Acts, and the facts we have already discussed about every real symbolic vision in the Bible destroy all attempts to allegorize God's command to rise, kill, and eat of the animals in the sheep. Truly, Peter never again repeats the Acts 10.28 statement, even in several places where it would have directly applied if that was the conclusion Peter had of the vision. For example, Peter did not reduce the vision to a statement about the Gentiles, even in the midst of a raging debate regarding the issue of Gentile compliance with laws concerning things like circumcision and food. Instead, our brother Peter actually replied to those who said it's necessary to circumcise the Gentiles and to command them to keep the law of Moses with a statement that was perfectly consistent with the vision he received being about food. Peter replied, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart, acknowledged the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us Jews. And God made no distinction between us Jews and those Gentiles, purifying the Gentiles' hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as the Gentiles. In a debate that ended with instructions about foods and certain physical activities that can spiritually defile even a Gentile convert, and in a debate that began with certain Pharisees arguing it's necessary to circumcise the Gentiles and to command them to keep the law of Moses, on the side that only someone who saw the vision as literally regarding foods would choose. But those who wrongly allegorize the vision 
Friends, they adopt the pharisaical side of that debate. The side that was rebuked by every single one of our Lord's apostles in a letter in Acts 15. And please notice that Peter himself characterized that pharisaical position as testing God and putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples. Also, please understand the issue they were debating in Acts chapter 15 was not what the Bible very specifically calls the traditions of the elders that included things like ritual hand washing. No, according to the Holy Bible itself, the issue they were debating was mandatory circumcision and mandatory adherence to certain aspects of the law of Moses for the Gentiles. And in that debate, Peter revealed how we must understand the vision he was given when he completely agreed with Paul, Barnabas, James, and the Jerusalem elders by rebuking the Pharisees. And our understanding of the vision must harmonize with the letter they all issued that stated the Gentiles should not be troubled with physical requirements for holiness beyond the four clear forms of spiritual defilement that Moses recorded even Gentiles were to avoid. Now, about those four very specific requirements laid out for the Gentile converts in the letter, Moses records that the Gentile we know as Noah was told he could eat every living thing that moves in Genesis chapter 9, but he was also told not to consume blood. And that is the reason behind two of the four commands, namely not eating animals that were strangled because it traps the blood in the meat and not consuming blood. Plus Moses also recorded that the Gentile cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of their sexual immorality. Therefore, even the Gentiles need to avoid such defilement. And finally, in Deuteronomy 18.12, Moses recorded that the Gentile nations of Canaan were destroyed for their idolatry. Therefore, simply by reading the writings of Moses, every student of the Bible can see the four physical things mentioned in the Jerusalem letter can spiritually defile anyone, including a Gentile. So the Gentiles had to avoid these four forms of spiritual defilement very carefully. Consequently, this is why James justified his conclusion that even the Gentiles must abstain from these four necessary and specific things by referring to Moses being taught from ancient times. Truly everyone who reads the books Moses wrote should be able to see that even Gentiles get judged for violating these four items of defilement. And this is why verse 21 of Acts chapter 15 begins with the word for or because. You see, verse 21 was the explanation of why these four items were necessary for the Gentiles to observe, and it specifically referred to Moses being preached in the past, not the future. So, despite the pharisaical claims of the comprehensive continuance teachers, verse 21 of Acts chapter 15 definitely is not an addendum to the Jerusalem letter that somehow mandates the Gentile converts must eventually listen to the circumcision party, the same people James was directly disagreeing with. And this is why verse 21 wasn't included in the Jerusalem letter. No, the whole council finally and openly rebuked those who were adding to these four physical requirements for the Gentile converts by saying, we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. 
and we see this understanding of Acts chapter 15 confirmed very clearly several years later in Acts chapter 21. There, James and the elders of Jerusalem said to Paul, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying, They ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take those men and be purified with them. Pay their expenses, that they may shave their heads, and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you, Paul, also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Clearly, the first century church decided once and for all that the Gentiles should not be forced to observe circumcision or to walk according to the customs of Levitical purification. But at the same time, the apostles clearly stated that the Gentile converts did need to avoid the four forms of spiritual defilement that had led to God's judgment on Gentile nations in the past. And this is the only harmonious interpretation of all that is written on this subject. Therefore, it is the correct interpretation and the solution to the continuity-discontinuity debate. Truly, the only connection between Peter's vision and the Gentiles was the fact that the Jews refused to go to or eat with one from another nation because Leviticus 11 declared that the Gentiles were unclean because their food was considered unclean. But God demolished that barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles with the vision he gave to Peter. And the Lord took away any reasons Peter once had to avoid preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. So that's why Peter stayed with Cornelius and ate with his household. Plus that is why Peter was accused when he returned to Jerusalem. But, when Peter explained his actions to his accusers, Peter gave us the real summary of his vision that we must all rely on to properly understand everything the Apostle Peter learned in Acts chapter 10. And, while Peter never mentioned anything even remotely similar to the words of Acts 10.28, Peter did mention the entire vision the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, and, frankly, the reasons why he later ate with the Gentiles. Or, in other words, Peter explained his eating with the Gentiles by speaking about the vision that was obviously about food, along with the fact that God no longer treated the Gentiles as unclean due to their food, so the Jews shouldn't either. Therefore, our God obviously accomplished two things through Peter's vision. First, the Lord declared he had made clean the foods Peter was still calling common and unclean. And second, by making those foods clean, the Gentiles were no longer to be considered unclean because of what they ate. Only in this way, can everything we read in the apostolic scriptures be literally understood and harmonized together? And if we make scripture itself our final, absolute authority in all matters of faith and practice, friends, 
We will never allegorize a single verse of the Holy Bible to hold on to our own understanding of things. Instead, we'll submit to the literal meaning of every passage and harmonize all of God's Word together as it's been progressively revealed to us. And in this way, we need to harmonize our interpretation of Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10 with the words of our brother Paul who wrote, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. We need to harmonize our interpretation of Peter's vision with the words of the Bible that declare. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of god and prayer we need to harmonize our interpretation of peter's vision with the principle of god's word that states food does not commend us to god for neither if we eat are we the better nor if we do not eat are we the worse? We need to harmonize our interpretation of Peter's vision with the command that exhorts us all, do not let anyone judge you in eating or in drinking, or in part of a feast, or of a new moon, or of Sabbaths, which are a shadow of coming things, but the body is of Christ. And we need to to understand as we interpret Peter's vision, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience concerned only with foods and drinks various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation sadly those who have allegorized peter's vision tend to object to all of these verses and they try to explain them away because these verses seem to contradict their understanding of leviticus chapter 11. And the truth is, Peter's vision and all of the verses we just reviewed do seem to contradict the interpretation of Leviticus chapter 11 that some people hold. But we must not ignore the undeniable fact that Leviticus chapter 11 seems to contradict a literal reading of Genesis 9-3 and Genesis 1-30. You see, friends, Despite the false teachings that many of our brothers and sisters have heard on the internet, the Bible has never monolithically taught one specific diet to all human beings. No, God himself told Noah, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. And we proved several weeks ago that the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts of this text show plainly that Noah was able to eat of all of the animals. In fact, we saw that Hebrew scholars have universally taught for thousands of years that Noah could eat of all of the animal kinds. So there really is no debate based solely on the language of the Bible regarding the issue of Noah's omnivorous diet compared to the Leviticus 11 diet. And while we can all agree that Leviticus chapter 11 does label unclean certain foods that are clearly less healthy and 
Leviticus chapter 11 can be a good guideline for a proper diet, even to a Gentile. The fact is, in the New Covenant, especially after Acts chapter 10, the Leviticus 11 diet must never be treated as a matter of obedience or mandatory obligation. Our Savior clearly explained there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of a man, these are the things that defile a man. And Jesus added, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it doesn't enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated? thus purifying all foods? Please think about how sweeping a statement Jesus just made, and remember as you ponder this that he who doesn't abide in the doctrine of Christ doesn't have God. Do you believe that any food that enters a man from outside and enters his belly can defile a man? Friends, this passage isn't just about bread or eating with unwashed hands. Jesus, our King, said nothing that enters a man from outside, and whatever enters a man from outside. So even if unclean food enters a person, that food does not make the person unclean. And once that food passes into the waste bowl, the food is eliminated and purged from the person. Now, some would claim that this contradicts their reading of Leviticus 11, and Jesus indicates that this interpretation is put forward by people who are without understanding. In Leviticus, if you came in contact with an unclean animal, you simply had to wash and be unclean until evening. And by evening, the Levitically unclean food would have passed from your body, rendering you Levitically clean, so you could re-enter the camp where God's holy tabernacle was set up. Meanwhile, there's not one single case of punishment ever recorded in Scripture for simply eating Levitically unclean food, and there's not one prescribed punishment for doing so beyond a ritual washing in a period of uncleanness. Now, for those who are thinking Isaiah 66, 17 somehow contradicts what I just stated, I ask you, please look at Isaiah chapter 65 from verse 3 to verse 5 to learn the truth, to learn that both chapters are speaking about idolatrous practices that have always carried the death penalty. And with that understood, I hope we can all now agree that allegorizing a passage that can easily be interpreted in a literal way puts you in charge of the Bible instead of the Bible in charge of you. And I hope and I pray that we can all now answer the question, if God tells me to do something three times, will I ever allegorize his direct command with a resounding no? While it is true that our God never changes, brothers and sisters, the food laws have changed several times in the Bible, from a vegetarian diet, to an omnivore diet, to a Levitical diet, and back to the omnivore diet. And along with those changes, the priesthood changed, the sacrifices changed, the tabernacle changed, and we now have a new and living way to approach the throne of grace that doesn't rely on the blood of bulls and goats or foods, drinks, various washings, or fleshly ordinances. And this is what the scriptures themselves teach when we allow them to speak literally from the very first Hebrew word of Genesis to the very last Greek word of Revelation. 